Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Vayera, the fourth portion in the book of Brishit, Genesis. So we're learning all about Abraham, our father, who was the personification of the attribute of kindness, chesed. Kindness, loving kindness, is Avraham's seal. And that seal is stamped at the very outset of our portion. The magnificent opening scene of Vayera gives us a glimpse of Avraham, a man who so lived to perform acts of kindness that for the sake of welcoming some guests, some strangers, he actually abandons a conversation with God himself, as it were, who appeared to him, who came to visit him as he recuperated on what our sages point out was the third and most painful day following his circumcision. The Hebrew in chapter 18 in verse 1 informs us that Avraham had been sitting Kichom Hayom, like, like in the heat of the day, it was an artificial fabricated heat, which God arranged especially that day in order to clear the streets of passerby, to spare his friend Avraham the trouble of having to tend to the needs of guests who may be found outside. God made it especially hot that day so that no one would be about. But seeing how disappointed Avraham was at his inability to bestow kindness upon wayfarers, God then brought him three angels in the guise of men. Upon seeing them, Avraham quickly rose up and prepared a meal for them. He feeds them and he waits on them. So our sages based a teaching on Avraham's behavior and the zealous and excited manner in which he received his guests that he actually preferred to bestow kindness upon strangers rather than visit with God himself. And they taught that giving hospitality to guests is greater than receiving the divine presence. For at the very time, that Avraham was conversing with God himself, as it says, and Hashem appeared to him in Elonai Mamre, Avraham left God to go and take care of the guests, feeding them and accompanying them. As we learned last week, Avraham's worldview, his understanding of God's purpose in creation and his relationship to creation was all based on Hashem's chesed, his loving kindness, so much so that that became Avraham's dominant trait and the device through which he himself sought to emulate God. Avraham's connection to the power of God's kindness was so great and so strong that he even interceded for the wicked city of Sodom, despite the horrible inhumanity and cruelty of those people. God himself charged Avraham and his descendants after him with the duty of taking responsibility for the whole world to safeguard humanity from becoming like the people of Sodom and to preserve the legacy of Adam. Thus, before destroying Sodom, whose inhabitants had once again, as had happened previously in history and previous generations, they had divested themselves of the image in which they were created through their total moral, moral deterioration, Hashem shared his plans in advance with Avraham, as if he reckoned him as a partner in creation. So we find in chapter 18 and verse 17, and Hashem said, shall I conceal from Avraham what I do? Now that Avraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him, for I have loved him, because he commands his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of Hashem, doing charity and justice, in order that Hashem might then bring upon Avraham that which he had spoken of him. Later in our parsha. We find in chapter 21 and verse 33 that Avraham planted an eshel. He actually established a spiritual retreat, an outreach center in Be'er Sheva. And there he proclaimed the name of Hashem, El, El Olam, God of the world. It was Avraham alone who proclaimed to all that there's a God in the world. So Avraham was a person who literally changed the world. He was a giant of faith. He was the first person who really believed in God and who taught others the meaning of belief in God. Yet God tested Avraham with 10 trials, and Avraham passed all of his tests with flying colors. According to most tallies, those trials in chronological order are, he had to hide for 13 years from King, from King Nimrod, who sought to kill him. Nimrod threw Avraham into a fiery furnace. God commanded Avraham to leave his family and homeland. As soon as he arrives in the land of Canaan, a famine forces him to leave and go to Egypt. Sarah is taken by Pharaoh in Egypt. Avraham has to go off to war to rescue his nephew Lot. God tells him that his descendants will suffer under four kingdoms. God commands Avraham to circumcise himself and his son Yishmael. God commands him to banish Hagar and Yishmael. And finally, 
God commands Avraham to offer Isaac on the altar. And this tenth and final test, known as Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, or simply the Akedah, takes place towards the conclusion of our portion of Vayera. And you know, it's impossible to ever really talk about Avraham Avinu without mentioning the Akedah, the climax of his career. It's what we talk about when we talk about Abraham. And it's much more than simply his tenth and final and most difficult test. It's the theological elephant in the room. The binding of Isaac is a cornerstone of, of Torah and a benchmark of faith. And it's left a powerful, indelible mark on our people in so many ways. We recite it as part of our morning prayers every day. And it's considered to be an eternal merit for all of Abraham's descendants, something so powerful that it continues to shield us to this day. It was an event that has eternal positive repercussions. As the Midrash relates, Hashem promised Avraham that every time he hears his children blow the shofar, he'll remember the binding of Isaac and extend mercy to his children. Since God never intended that Avraham actually slaughter his son, presumably what he remembers and accrues to his children as eternal merit is Avraham's willingness to obey God's command. It's so much about the episode remains unfathomable to us and lends a certain inscrutability to our understanding of Avraham's relationship with Hashem. We ask ourselves, how must it have been for him? How could Avraham have understood this command to offer up his son? How totally incomprehensible this must have been to our father Avraham, whose lifelong hope was finally realized at the age of 100 with the birth of his son, whose very conception and birth was not just improbable, but a total miracle. And then to receive God's promise that this boy will be the continuation of his line through Isaac, not Ishmael, shall your seed be called, in chapter 21 and verse 12. And then, after all the travail and the promises, the hopes, to be told to offer him up as an offering, this should be enough to send any man, presumably even the first of the true believers, into a tailspin of unprecedented crisis. And secondly, Though the pathos of the parent-child dynamic was surely an excruciating aspect of this test, on a deeper level still, consider the mind-numbing irony of the fact that Avraham's life's work was teaching the world that this very thing was abhorrent to God. And he's the one who educated everyone that abominable pagan rites like human sacrifice is exactly what the one God does not want. If there's one thing that Avraham was known for, it was his passionate stand against the very thing that he was now commanded to do. And thirdly, open up your heart. This does not seem to fit the template of Avraham's worldview, of his, his conception of God, does it? Where is the manifestation of loving kindness in the divine command to bring a son as an offering? And how did that fit in with Avraham's expectations? Like all of Avraham's tests, this one called upon him to exercise inner strengths that went against his nature. It was actually the diametric opposite of everything that Avraham was all about, what he stood for, what he lived for. That's why it was a test that was tailor-made for him. So now get ready. We read, And Abraham arose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took his two young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood for a burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So open up your heart. He's traveling for three days. Let's travel along with him. It took him three days to get close enough to where he's going. And finally, on the third day, he looks up and he sees the place from a distance. In Hebrew, the verse tells us that he saw hamakom, the place from a distance. This word hamakom is also used as an allusion to Hashem himself, since he is the placeholder of existence. So on a simple level, seeing Hamakom from a distance conveys the thought that despite his obedience and zeal to obey God, it must have been so difficult, so incomprehensible for him, this command. He saw Hashem from afar. God was obscured for him. The Midrash states that he saw a cloud at the top of the mountain, so he said to himself, I think this must be the place that the Holy One, blessed be He, had in mind. And of course, this is none other than Mount Moriah. 
the place of the holy temple. And the, and the altar upon which Avraham bound Isaac is the place of the altar of Adam. So the cloud certainly represents the Shekhinah, the divine presence. But at the same time, it could also be a sign of the obscurity that covered over everything in Avraham's mind. So listen carefully. Right after this verse of seeing the place from afar, the next verse states, And Avraham said to his young men, that is Ishmael and Eliezer, Stay here by yourselves with the donkey, while I and the lad, Yitzchak, will go yonder, we will worship, and we will return to you. How could he say that both he and Isaac would be returning? So our sages state that Avraham was prophesizing, though he didn't know exactly what he was prophesizing, and that through the words that he uttered, he created the reality. So open up your hearts now in the very deepest way possible, deeper than ever, and listen. What does it mean to see something from a distance? When you're standing up close and you peer too closely at something, you're only focusing on one view one aspect of what actually could be a sprawling panorama in front of you. But when you step back and you get the perspective that distance provides, then you can see the whole picture. There's a great, great secret here. As soon as Father Abraham was able to see Hashem from a distance, he saw the whole picture. He saw that it's all good. He saw that this too, the binding of Isaac, was somehow chesed, Hashem's loving kindness. He didn't understand it yet. He didn't know what he was prophesizing. But he knew that somehow this has to be a part of God's kindness, and that's what it means when he sensed that they were both coming back. People talk a lot about God's love, and some people say, God is love. But if it's subject to one's own interpretation and definition and expectation of what one needs that love to look like, what happens if the deck that I'm dealt doesn't appear to me like love. Does that mean he doesn't love me? When my expectations are not met, do I stop believing in God's love? Or will I have the prophetic vision to know that I don't have to understand everything right now to know that Hashem created the world in kindness and runs it in kindness? Whether or not what happens fits my expectations. Avraham took a step back and saw the whole picture and knew in his unclear prophecy that there's no contradiction, that it's all chesed. And speaking about the future rectified world, the prophet Zechariah tells us in chapter 14 that on that day, Hashem and his name will be one. And the, fam- the sages famously ask on this verse, but are he and his name not one right now? Why only on that day will he and his name be one? So the answer that nowadays, in the world as we know it and in which we live, We suffer from a fragmented, false perception of reality, manifested in the following manner. Upon receiving good news, we're accustomed to recite a blessing over glad tidings. It goes, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who is good and who does good. And there's also a blessing to be recited upon hearing, heaven forbid, bad news. We say, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, the true judge. However, our sages continue, the secret of Zechariah's prophecy is that on that future day, when our understanding is complete and our consciousness is expanded, then we'll only recite one blessing on everything, the blessing of who is good and who does good. And no longer will we differentiate and recite the blessing of the true judge, because at that time, we'll be able to perceive with a new awareness that actually, it's all good. We only perceive things as bad according to our limited understanding, but actually, it's all good. Thus, Rabbi Nachman tells us, open up your heart, how does one experience a little taste of the future world while yet in this world? Is that possible? Yes, he says. He says, to really know that everything that happens to you is for the best is to taste a little of the future world here and now. We're all tested all the time, every day. Everything is a test. And the tests, as they were for Avraham, are tailor-made for each of us, and they're not on our terms. That's why it's a test. But to know that everything is chesed, even if I can't see it, even if I can't understand it, that's a future vision. Like Avraham seeing that somehow they would be returning together. A vision that sees the whole and sees that ultimately it will be proven. It's all good. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. 
If you enjoy these presentations and benefit from these teachings, please consider helping Jerusalem Lights with your support. Only your support enables these broadcasts to continue and grow.